around uh, what we're seeing as far as the industry. And a lot of us are in a lot of different roles, and there's so many different things that happen um, in our industry. We have everybody from you know, uh, malware reversers to exploit researchers to pen testers and red teamers to blue team folks to people that are in compliance and audits. So we have so many different uh, breeds of people here today with so many different experiences. Um, and we'll talk, and I'll try to hit on a lot of those, those different areas on security and what we're seeing um, as far as a continuous, uh, con continuously changing industry. I think Sean did a great introduction myself. I don't need to go in anymore. Um, but, uh, you know, I was a Marine, uh, and I was stationed in uh, Hawaii uh, for five years. It was a really hard duty station. Um, you know, a lot of sun and, and beaches and things like that. Uh, but I did, did, did two tours in Iraq. Um, I, I did a lot of uh, signals intelligence. So when you saw the Saddam statue fall, um, I was already inside of um, Iraq doing signals collection and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, but I got out and I uh, was in a small consulting shop for a little bit, and then I became a chief security officer for a Fortune 1000 company. Um, and it was interesting because uh, being a, in, going into an organization that was like, you know, suits and ties, and I was like, I think at the time I was like 26, I was one of their youngest, uh, I guess, VPs in history or whatever. Um, it's interesting having to work with a bunch of people and, and try to build a security program, and that's where I started to learn a lot of the, uh, the stuff around um, actually building stuff in enterprises. But I do work on uh, Mr. Robot 2. Um, if you saw episode one, season five, I think it was, uh, where they're hacking into uh, Steel Mountain. Um, and then Elliot is uh, about to get caught because he's trying to social engineer his, his way into, I think it was like level five. Uh, they use the social engineer toolkit to spoof a text message and then uh, you know, uh, say that your husband is in the hospital and so then you got Elliot to level five. And then season two, episode one, um, they, did, uh, they deployed ransomware to Evil Corp. Uh, I think it was Darlene uh, deployed ra ransomware to Evil Corp. And so I uh, helped a little bit with that to use the social engineer toolkit. Um, but it's been fun. You know, it's kind of cool working with uh, different uh, things like that and kind of trying to portray accurate representations of, of hackers um, in the news. I'm also considered one of the world's sexiest men alive. Um, it's not Photoshopped, actually. It's not Photoshopped. It wasn't for me, though, but uh, it, when I was on the Katie Kirk show a couple years ago, I was a little bit heavier uh, than that's Big Dave, and I'm Little Dave. Um, but Big Dave uh, was talking on Katie Kirk, and I hacked somebody live in the audience or whatever, and uh, Benedict Cumberpatch, who is the guy that plays like Sherlock and uh, um, you know, a lot of the other um, uh, movies and everything, um, he was coming up next, and it said, up next, one of the world's sexiest men alive, but they removed the up next for like a couple seconds, and I happened to be on the TV show, and of course, you know, all my buddies found out and made it go viral, so... Um, <laughs> I'm sticking with it. I don't think it was an accident. I'm just going to keep, keep going on with that and uh, go from there. It's amazing, though. Like, that's actually a white shirt, and they changed the hue contrast to make it look like I was wearing a pink shirt because it tailored towards the demographics of the audience. So it's amazing how they do all that stuff, but uh, I was not wearing a pink shirt, by the way. That's actually a blue tie. Anyways. So we talk about today and why we're here today. You know, it seems like um, when you look at what's happening in the industry today, um, things are evolving in all aspects, um, and that's a good thing. Uh, we see technology advancing at a rapid rate, uh, technology integration into businesses to where you know, we have to have the latest tech. We have the Internet of Things, where we have you know, devices all over our infrastructure network, and now with the CIA leaks, now they're hacking into smart TVs and everything else that's out there. So you see a lot of stuff happening out there, and then you see a lot of security products coming out touting that they can fix everything around that, right? You know, hey, we can fix today's problems with you know, this specific piece of software and it's going to stop everything. Um, and when you look at, at how technology is moving at such a fast, fast pace, it's really difficult for us in the security industry to get a hold of that. I think if you look at most corporations, you know, if you have a, a, an organization of 10,000 people, we would be in a perfect world when it comes to security if we had 10,000 people dedicated to security. You could literally sit behind somebody and be like, nope, don't click that, that's bad. You know, that would be wonderful, right? We'd have an awesome you know, life where you know, compromises probably didn't happen. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have um, that capacity to be able to work with people on a day-to-day -day basis to introduce new technology and, and secure it. And so you look at environments, and you have a, a choice in a lot of organizations between complexity and simplicity. And when I say that is a lot of the, the, uh, the things that we're doing today introduce complexity, introducing SIMs, and introducing next-generation firewalls. A good example with next generation firewalls, um, usually a, co a company has, you know, let's just say 10 you know, network engineers that are specifically focused on Cisco, right? And Cisco has been what they know for the rest of their lives, and they, they've known Cisco for 10 years, and you have this whole infrastructure set up, and you want to get to the next generation line, so you want to go with Palo Altos. So you're like, well, hey, we're going to get next gen, so we're going to go with Palo Altos, and now you get this Palo Alto here, and you have all these 10 years of, of historical non-segmentation and bad security practices, and then you just use the, the importer tool from Cisco to Palo Alto, and all of a sudden you're supposed to be next gen, right? 
Now your engineers that are 10 Cisco engineers have no idea what they're doing with the new Palo Altos, and now you have the same rules that you had before, but then you have a whole bunch of complexity on top of it, and now you're hopefully getting better at detecting attacks somehow. And so complexity isn't always a great thing in environments when we see what's happening. Now the good news is we have companies Um, stops the hackers, uh, artificial intelligence that prevents hackers from breaking into your infrastructure, right? 99.9%. .9%. Um, goodbye data breaches from Barracuda. Um, you know, conceptual things that, that make absolutely no sense whatsoever and are a complete marketing FUD, but yet, you know, executives see this and say, hey, why aren't we there yet? Why aren't we stopping 99.9% .9 of the breaches? And I want you to go with this product because it stops all of that. And so, you have technology that's touting artificial intelligence and machine learning, and, and I, I honestly think um, in the future it will be something that is absolutely uh, applicable. But in most cases, it's, it's just a lot of marketing, millions and millions of dollars thrown at marketing. And for us as attackers, it's extremely easy for us to circumvent and get around. So to me, what actually works and what I see working is looking at organizations in a different way. I don't care about the technology per se. I don't care what you have in your environment. But my whole purpose in life, in security, is to minimize the noise. And what I mean by noise is there's certain things that in your environment that you can stop today. Right now, with a little bit of hard work and elbow grease, you can stop, you can stop a lot of the noise that you see today. If you look at infection rates, was it 92% of all infections still come from executables? Executables, 92%? That was like back in the AOL days, in like the proggy days where you're deploying malware to someone's machine and you had sub-7 and all that good stuff, right? We're still fighting with that today. And so if you look at most of the infection rates, you can eliminate 92% of the noise by just baselining what you have in your environment, not allowing non-code signed uh, uh, executables, um, you know, only doing certain uh, exceptions based off of your environment, things that actually work in environments to reduce your level of effort, and then focusing on that 8% that you really need to focus on in your environment. So reducing the scope of what you have to do on your attack surface. And so I'll talk a little about that um, and what that means. But how do you really focus on what matters? And so if you look at focusing on what matters, and I think the, uh, the new name and, and what you're going to be doing next year uh, with this conference, you know, the, the concept around red and blue making that purple piece is, is a concept that I truly believe in in this industry. You know, a lot of us that are on the defense, we sit there all day, you know, trying to respond to incidents. And on top of that, we have meetings upon meetings upon meetings upon meetings, but yet somehow we're supposed to get that one flaw in all of our data that happens to be in our sim that leads to a breach that we can detect early on so we can minimize the damage to our corporation. And so we're in a very interesting dilemma because we have Blue Team, which has a lot of different components um, that are part of their day-to-day -day and don't necessarily understand a lot of the offensive side of, of how we're actively attacking. Same thing for Red. When I go in and I attack specific organizations, I learn new ways of defending that I've never seen before. And so we'll talk a little about that and what that means. So if you look at everything um, embedded, um, you know, we look at what we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis, we have to understand each other. We have to understand the red side, we have to understand the blue side in order to come together to figure out a better approach to understanding what's going on there in the attack side. You look at all of these products that are out there today, they're not built from an attacker's mindset. They're built, like a good example um, is uh, EDRs. Everybody familiar with EDRs? Endpoint detection and response, it's a new buzzword, it's a whole market now that's kind of booming up there. So you have EDRs, and EDRs are supposed to give you better visibility into your environment. That's great. I think they're great tools for collecting information, very much so like what a SIM could do. But do you know what to look for in your environment? What those indicators of compromises look like? What those attack patterns look like? Because you don't have an entire team dedicated to red. You're, you're going to miss a significant amount of things. A good example is like, um, like sub-T stuff that he did with Reg SVR32 for application whitelisting bypasses. Do you know to look for SCTs in your environment that are downloading and beaconing out to the internet? Some may. That's great. Some may not. You know, and there's different indicators to look for in your environment that, that really, um, and those, those tools can help you with, but you don't have that institutional knowledge unless you build it internally. And so we have to switch our tactics um, around how we handle it. And you, you probably heard the term hunt teaming coming out, right? Um, the term hunt teaming where you actively go out and look for indicators of compromises in your environments, looking for uh, abnormal behaviors aside from what you would traditionally see in your, your, your regular monitoring detection programs in your sims. That's a great concept. So what we see oftentimes is what red does looks like magic. Most of the time, it's pretty simplistic stuff. It's not heavily sophisticated attacks, um, and I'll show you a few of these here in just a minute. 
Um, but in a lot of cases, these attacks take advantage of individuals, i.e. phishing or whatnot. Direct exploitation is much more difficult. Um, when I target individuals, I usually don't even use browser exploits anymore. Um, and the reason for that is, you know, if I'm, if I'm targeting an organization, most organizations aren't consistent across the board. Someone might be using IE as a browser, um, it may be Edge as another browser, maybe Chrome as another. Does everybody have the same versions of browsers that everybody supports across your entire environment? Does everybody have the same version of Adobe across their entire environment? Maybe, if you do decent patch management. So we have a lot of different components in our environments that change how I, at I attack an organization. And so if in order for me to exploit somebody, I need to know the exact operating system, the version that they're running, and the specific exploit that I'm gonna target them from. That's a lot of work. But instead, if I don't wanna run exploits, I can just take advantage of how Windows is designed to work, how applications are designed to work, and just have them open and download something and execute it. Macros are still great, uh, direct data types are still great, um, HTA files. I still don't know why nobody is blocking .hta extensions from their, their um, outbound internet for what you can download on the, on the web. Go to your web content filtering, stuff now and block .hta files. It's literally like full code execution like Java applets are, and all you have to do is click open. It's pretty ridiculous, yet no one blocks it. And that's what's being actively used for those click buys now um, with like the Adobe Chrome updaters. Like hey, your, your Chrome extension is, is out of date, you need to update it, and you go to that site and you click open and it does PowerShell injection, compromises your machine, um, usually establishes a, a, a keystroke logger and steals credentials. So, you know, there's a lot of things that are out there from the hacker side that may seem like magic. So I'm gonna play you a video that I did on, on CNN. I like this one, if you've seen it, I apologize. But um, you know, this one on CNN was pretty funny because it shows how easy it is um, to get into an organization. And a lot of times what I do when I'm, when I'm social engineering, I'm going after a specific target, I usually do my research um, on the individual I'm targeting. Salespeople are the best, um, by far. Like you can be like, hey, I'm gonna give you a million dollars, I need you to click on this malware.exe so that you can get your proposal signed. Okay, you know, it's no problem, right? You can do whatever you need to with salespeople. Um, help desk is also great. Uh, marketing is great as well, but help desks are great because what's help desk function? To help, right? They're there to help you. Now, as pen testers, when we try to simulate real world activities, what do we do? We try to like reset passwords and stuff like that, right? Well, if you try to reset somebody's password, you need to know a lot of information about that, that person that you're targeting. Um, you know, date of birth, probably social security numbers or employee ID, things like that that they will use to, to help you reset. But if you just take advantage of a help desk function to help and you don't require anything sensitive, anything had to be abnormal that would trigger something in their brain to say, hey, this is weird, you're probably okay. And they're, they're probably gonna help you. And guess what? What do they typically have? Elevated rights in their environment, right? So you probably have administrative rights over at least the endpoints themselves. And I can go from Bob and I in, in, in help desk to Jane in IT that has access to server environments and I can start attacking different systems. So targeting functions um, based off of specific areas and organizations is 100% applicable. And a lot of times I'll do like, like if I'm going after salespeople, I'll actually set up a fake, um, you know, like, like um, business that's in their industry vertical, if they're B2B or, you know, B2C. I'll set up a, a certain like site that's in their industry vertical that they would go for. I'm like, hey, I need to spend like $2 million by next week. Can you help me out? And like literally, like as soon as you hit the send button, you're getting a response back and they're calling you on the phone and they're trying to go to your door and knock on your door, right? So you can, at that point in time, you have whatever you want to, you can get them to do whatever you want to. So this is what I did on CNN. This is, you know, um, and, and if, you, if you Google certain companies, they'll do like press releases or the credit card company would do press releases, especially if they're large. So I can tell that they use a certain credit card brand. Um, and so I was like, hey, this is so-and-so fraud services. I spoofed the 888 number. Um, I'm like, hey, are you currently traveling internationally right now? I see a lot of uh, uh, transactions in Paris. And I'll just call him Bob. His name's not Bob, but I'll just say Bob. 
Bob's like, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm in Paris right now. I'm sorry, I, didn't, I forgot to call ahead of time to let you know I was going to Paris. Everything's fine. I'm in Paris. I'll be here. I'm like, okay, well, how long are you going to be there for? Um, you know, when are you going to uh, be departing so we can go through um, and, and mark that in your account? And he's like, oh, I'll be here until Friday. You know, thank you so much. You folks are always great with it. I'm like, yeah, I just need to go over a couple of quick transactions just to make sure they're okay. And I can tell Bob's in a, a, a really crowded area, right? You know, and you can tell he's starting to get annoyed with me because he, at this point in time, like, he's already, you know, said what he needed to say and he, you know, you're going to confirm it, but now I have to do an additional step. And this is a bad position to be in social engineering because he's annoyed and I have a small window of time now to actually calm this person to what I want to do. And so what I, want, I needed to do is I needed to move him off center, what we call moving off center, so that I put him in a defensive mode where he needs me in order to fix a situation. So I started um, naming off some really horrible places like underground dungeon stuff uh, for, for credit card transactions, right? Um, horrible websites, um, you know, things that, that you never want to have on your corporate card ever in the history of corporate cards. Um, and so Bob starts to freak out. And he's like, no, 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 those aren't me. I'm like, well, you just weren't in Frankfurt, you know, a week ago at this place here, you know, it's a known uh, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, he's like, no, no, this is not me. My credit card's been compromised. What can we do? I'm like, okay, don't worry. You're going to be in Paris, right? I'm like, he's like, yes, yes. You can hear, you know, he's panicking a little bit. And I'm, I can do whatever I want to at this point, right? I'm like, hey, you know, <laughs> I need you to buy me some stuff off of Amazon. I'm like, okay, is that going to help it? But um, I was like, Bob, what I need you to do is I need you to give me your full credit card number for security purposes, just so I can verify who you are. It reads off his full social, you know, uh, credit card number. I'm like, the CVV, the, you know, the number, and I'm like running it down. I'm mean, all sitting there giggling and everything, you know, laughing. Um, and uh, then I started like asking him for a social security number, which I already had, but I just for, for purposes, gives me his full social. I'm like, give me date of birth. I'm like, what's your wife's last four of her social? What's your kid's last four? And at that point, he started, you know, he's like, what? But you need my kids? I'm like, right. anyways, so it was a good, it was, it was a, a good success based off of uh, that one, so. Companies pay him to find out if employees are leaving the company vulnerable. He and his team show Um, because, you know, obviously very quick to, to go and taking advantage of help desk. I mean, you could do anything, though. Like, um, uh, so, um, the public relations folks um, on people's uh, uh, websites, you can target them individually because they always respond to, like, media inquiries. So you can just pretend to be a media um, inquiry, and then you can establish, you know, and have them open up an Excel document, you compromise their computer, and then whatever. So there's many ways of going after um, individual uh, people. Now, the issue with that is the hardest component of any security program, at least to me, is, is not just our attack surface of what we have out there, but our ability to detect an attack. If you don't detect that initial intrusion, that initial point in time where somebody clicked the link, something, someone hit open, the help desk clicked open, at that point in time, you're pretty much going blind to other techniques. Things like lateral movement um, you know, starts to become much more difficult, persistence hooks, command and control infrastructure. All of those things start to become much more difficult um, if you don't detect that initial intrusion. I'll talk a little bit about that here in just a second. If you look at the weakest gaps in security that we have today, you know, the, the initial reconnaissance phase of actively going after an organization, like, hey, uh, doing some who is information, looking at the, the company itself, um, the sites that they have, um, looking at, you know, hey, do I need to build or buy an exploit kit or something like that? Maybe do some preliminary testing for detection and phishing. LinkedIn, by the way, a fantastic resource um, uh, for, for um, attackers because a lot of times people put all of their um, history on there. Like, hey, we just implemented ArcSight a week ago, and now I know you have like no monitoring detection capabilities whatsoever in your environment because ArcSight takes like 16 years to implement, right? You know, so, you know, I know you have like nothing in your environment that's going to detect me, or hey, we have semantic endpoint protection and we did it a year and a half ago. Great, hey, and I, and I need to get around semantic, right? So, LinkedIn provides a lot of in, uh, email as well. Another good uh, thing to try too is most companies will do uh, content filtering based off of categorization of sites. Um, so like categories, for example, like a lot of people will block uncategorized sites, uh, freshly new registered domains, 
Um, you can go to like GoDaddy or whatever and look at previously expired sites and you can look them up in the categorizations and you can see like, hey, this has been categorized in you know, retail and commercial. This has been categorized. You just go buy the domain, point it to your phishing site and use it as your phishing site. It's fantastic. So just look for expired domains and it gets rid of all your categorizations um, you ever need. Um, so there's some good stuff there. So if I set my infrastructure up to get around your defenses, you know, the, the hardest and the weakest places that we have currently today is that initial intrusion. If I don't detect how the attacker establishes access to my infrastructure, that's a problem. Um, if you're using things like application whitelisting, a lot of them are moving more towards um, more in-memory type attacks like PowerShell injection, um, other methods that, that rely specifically off of that. But if I don't detect the initial intrusion, attacker typically establishes a command and control so I can operate that machine um, and then move to different systems. So that's what we call lateral movement. Uh, using information off of one machine, let's just say it's the local hashes or Kerberos tokens or things in memory um, or SPNs as a method for, for um, extraction and cracking. We'll take those credentials and we move from one system to the next system to the next system until we get access to somebody that has access to the servers and then they have access to the servers. We need access to this database that has all the intellectual property in it. So the lateral movement component of it, if you can't flag on that, that's also another problem in a weak area of detection. Uh, persistence hooks are some of the easiest to detect depending on how it's done, but a lot of times it becomes very difficult. So here's a story time um, of, of some PowerShell stuff. Now, uh, one of our, our customers was using uh, Carbon Black, and, and I like Carbon Black. I think it's actually a pretty decent uh, uh, tool. It's like sending an IAM cannon throughout your network um, you know, of every single piece of packet data. I've never seen actually anybody implement it fully across their environment, but it's a good tool for information. Um, and, and I think you know, leveraging it, if you can support it, um, it does a good job at actually um, being able to query a lot of data and to figure out what's going on if you know what you're doing. But we were working with a customer on a purple team exercise, and so we have you know, two folks in the red, two folks in the blue. And uh, they had done a really good job on PowerShell detection, especially when it comes around things like invoke expression, um, encoded commands. If you don't know this, by the way, there's 12 different variations of encoded command. Um, hopefully you knew that. So you, know, you don't have to do you know, dash encoded command to get around execution restriction policies. You can do dash E, abbreviated, dash EC, which most people don't know about. Um, dash EC is the super abbreviated version that most people don't even uh, trigger a flag for. You can do dash EN, dash ENC, dash ENCO. So you can do 12 different variations um, of encoded command. Well, this customer had a really good um, set of, of detection criteria around those 12 specific areas of, of encoded command. So when we do these um, types of assessments, we try to figure out ways around the detection to get better. And so I just recently released a new version of, of Unicorn um, and the Social Engineer Toolkit, but I actually just released a new version of Unicorn yesterday as I was on the plane flying here um, and that does a lot more obfuscation um, against these types of attacks. So I heavily recommend it. I'll show you an example here. We go. Windows is actually running, that's a good thing. Oh, we'll get it right. There we go. All right, so if you're not familiar with you We get to keep it kind of on one, one command line. And uh, one of my favorite folks in the security industry, uh, Matthew Graber, came out with the technique of le leveraging PowerShell to load shellcode directly into memory. Now, why that's important is most attacks rely off of dropping to disk, right? So, hey, I have to write an executable or a file of some sort and execute that on the machine and then from there compromise it. Well, with PowerShell native injection, what you can do is you can take shellcode, uh, machine code, directly shove it into memory and execute and never touch disk. So it's very evasive when it comes to um, the types of detection you have. Now, um, with Matthew's attack, I expanded on it a little bit and I did what was called an x86 downgrade attack. So if you're running in a 32-bit or 64-bit platform, I wanna have one set of shellcode that I can fit on one command line to execute on the system itself. And so what it does is it detects if it's in a 64-bit operating system or 32-bit, and if it's in a 64-bit, it'll downgrade that process to a 32-bit process and then execute the shellcode natively with 32-bit shellcode. Um, why that's important though is, you know, there was a, a time there where Unicorn was getting picked up by, by things like antivirus and stuff like that, right? That's no longer an issue anymore whatsoever, uh, trust me. Um, so it, it employs heavy obfuscation now um, into the new version um, and it doesn't uh, get picked up by anything currently, so it's kind of a cool thing. So let's go ahead and
As soon as they hit open, it compromises their computer. Um, you can do uh, the macro injection. So the macro injection is really good um, if people still leverage macros. Um, it's heavily obfuscated. It doesn't get picked up by anything um, out there currently that I know of. Um, and so as soon as they open up the macro, it says, hey, you know, um, Windows, uh, this file is corrupt. Please download a newer version of Windows. And it exits, you know, the machine, but then compromises them with PowerShell injection without touching disk. So there's quite a few different methods um, that's built into um, Unicorn. A lot of those techniques are also employed into the Social Engineer Toolkit as well. Uh, but with the new version, if you go ahead and run it, but you can get it from github.com slash trustedsec. So github.com slash trustedsec and Unicorn's underneath there. Um, I'll just use Windows, Meterpreter. Actually, I need to get my IP address first. And then let's give, give it my IP address and my local host. And then I'll just do 443. And it'll go ahead and generate the payload for you. It'll generate two um, pieces of it. The, the first will be um, the PowerShell code and the second one will be the Metasploit listener. Um, so you just have to do MSF console dash R and then um, open up that RC file. But this is essentially what the attack will look like. Uh, PowerShell attack. So it's an, uh, let me see if I can blow this up a little bit. Actually, I'll just nano it so you can see it better. Or VI, whatever you prefer. So we can see here, it starts to run a PowerShell command. Now it's, it's obfuscated, the variable names are obfuscated. It never actually calls encoded command in any way, shape, or form. Um, or dash E or dash EC or anything like that. So it's gonna get around traditional detection. Um, the way that I would look at detecting this is the length of the PowerShell command itself um, and PowerShell itself calling out to an external um, you know, uh, IP address. Those are two behaviors that you can look for um, for this specific one. But you can see as soon as you run this, um, it's obfuscated. The only thing that you can also trigger on too is uh, value to string. That's also not typically um, used very often. But then it'll go ahead and execute the encoded command, which is a base64 encoded string with all of our Metasploit shellcode in it. As soon as it's run, it'll compromise the machine and then give you access uh, to that computer. So let's try a little bit of a different attack, and I'll actually show you a live one here. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and launch Unicorn again. But I'm gonna, instead of doing blank there, I'm gonna type in HTA at the end of it. And this will generate everything that I need to launch a HTA-based attack um, against an organization with everything there. Now, the new version that I just released yesterday if you go to the HTA tax folder and edit the launcher, um, one of the things that, that AV was flagging on when it gets executed was wscript.shell. So it never actually calls wscript.shell anymore. It obfuscates it and mangles it, so you can't see that anymore. Um, and so all the variable names now are all modified. Um, and it also, you know, if they happen to be flagging on command.exe, I split that up to it, randomizes that. Um, and then if it, you know, I, I try to randomize as much as possible to get around. Um, anything that's, that's out there has been kind of stupid with it. Signature-based stuff is absolutely ridiculous. Um, and so and it was actually a funny story. Uh, Microsoft Security Essentials uh, was flagging on, um, so if you did PowerShell-ENC and you had a PowerShell command that was long, it would trigger that in, in Microsoft Security Essentials. But if you did dash en, it was fine. It wouldn't trigger on anything that was out there. It's ridiculous. And we're seriously still at this point in security. Anyways. So I'll just copy this. And I'll launch my, uh, the, uh, launch a different window here. I'm just gonna create a listener real quick. Once that's good, we'll go over to our Windows machine. Come on, wake up. Let's use Internet Explorer. You can use Edge. You can use whatever you want to. website pops open, um, it'll actually have a prompt to open. Now that's the part where whether or not it's successful or not. You know, does the user actually click that open button? You can build those into your emails, by the way. Like, hey, as part of an employee verification process, you have to click open for us to verify your computer is on the domain or whatever, right? You can, you can make up any excuse you want to for people to click on it. Um, but we have a high, high, high success rate at this. Um, usually if we, we build our pretext right, 
it's usually around 92 to 94 percent, and usually the reason why we don't get like 100 percent is because people are on vacation. Um, so it just depends. So as soon as you get this, you get this click to open. It executes. You know, uh, most of the, the newer next generation um, uh, EDRs and products that are out there, they don't typically flag on heavy PowerShell attacks, especially obfuscated, and embedded things like macros and stuff like that. So usually you can go pretty, pretty easy against that. PE start to get a little bit, or executables tend to get a little bit um, harder in a lot of cases, um, but that's just a good example. Now, you can do the same thing uh, for uh, Excel. Tell my command again. That's another one. That's fine. And I think you just do macro. Oop, oh, go back down the directory. You do macro. Um, this will generate all the macro code that you need. That's already obfuscated for you to, uh, and it gives you the instructions on how you actually put the macro in the Excel document. Um, so if you just want to do, you just open this up. There's your obfuscated. And notice, notice here. I split up PowerShell, so if you're looking at PowerShell inside of there. <laughs> Buttholes writing signatures for that. Uh-huh. What's that? Yeah. I haven't seen auto-open being detected, but I know that for uh, Microsoft Word versus Excel, it's auto underscore open or auto open one word. So you have to change that based off of if you're doing um, Word or Excel. So um, if you're using, I think it's, uh, if you're using Word, you have to do just straight sub auto open and that will work uh, usually. I haven't seen anything actually triggering on auto open itself. What, what, what sometimes will happen is, is like some of the sandboxing technology like Wildfire or FireEye, um, what it'll do with those macros is it'll put it in the virtual machine and see if it's actually calling out to the internet. In some cases like that, you can get snagged for sure. Um, usually putting like time-based delays in there, or um, my favorite uh, technique to get around that is there's VB code out there, I think I wrote a blog post on it, um, that you can do um, detection of CPU cores, and if CPU cores are less than two, then don't run. And so what'll happen is it profiles wildfire and fire eye sandboxes, which are predictable sandbox containers, and it won't actually execute or, or move, and you can just get past that, and it actually delivers to the endpoint user himself. So there's a few ways around it, depending on how you want to build it. Um, but you know, the VB code, what's great about VB code versus the PowerShell command is that you can make your macros as long as you want to and as complex as you want to, versus the PowerShell command itself has to be super condensed um, on the command line. So just some good, good tips there. I haven't seen anything flagging on auto-open specifically. And honestly, though, too, I will also say that I typically don't use macros as much. I will most likely use um, web attack vectors because it's easier for people to click links. Um, people always click links all the time. So, like, if you build your pretext good enough, you don't have to worry about going through all that sandbox stuff and, and, and their perimeter defenses. People just click the link, and you have a decent enough rep reputation. Um, doesn't typically fi uh, find it. So. Good question. As soon as this comes back up, okay. Um, so attack vector detection on this one. One, .hta files, block them. Just block them from the internet, please. Just block .hta files so you can make a, we have like eight different other techniques that we like to use, but .hta files are still so highly successful. So are Java applets, by the way, still, I don't know why. Um, Java applets still work. Um, but you know, block those if you can from the outside. Whitelist them if you have to, for absolutely. Um, looking for inside the HTA file, if you see certain things, um, length of the HTA files, um, I, I haven't seen an actual application that leverages HTAs anymore. I think there's some like Xerox for old print stuff, but that's all local internal things that don't need to go on the internet. So you can typically block this. Um, additionally, you can block the extension type through software restriction policies within Microsoft, or um, if you're um, Windows 10 or above, you can do device guard, um, block HTA extensions or anything that, that has those in there from actually running on your endpoints themselves. So you can stop a lot of that. Next, attacking Microsoft's advanced threat protection. Anybody saw the blogs in this one? It wasn't a very, or the, the Twitter war that went on between Microsoft and I, it wasn't so good. But uh, um, I won't go into that. It's, it's fine, it's all over with. We're all happy again. So um, long story short, Microsoft has their um, uh, Office 365 offering that they just came out with last year called Advanced Threat Protection, ATP. Um, and they also have what's called ATA, Advanced Threat Analytics. Um, so if you're an Office 365 customer, if you're an E5 um, customer, you can also purchase it when you're E3, you have to contact the sales rep for it. But if you're an E5 user within um, Office 365, you can get advanced rep protection. And it has two components. Um, one is called SafeLinks. 
The other one is called um, uh, um, uh, mail flow or something like that, or mail, advanced mail protection, sorry. What SafeLinks does, which I'm totally against, by the way, just like 100%, 90 million times against, is what, what do we tell our users to do when we have an email that comes in with a link on it? Hover over the link? Or don't, for, well, first of all, don't click it, right? But second, hover over the link to make sure it's legitimate, right? So what Microsoft does is they rewrite the URL to go through their own site first, which is called SafeLinks, and so when you hover over the link, it just shows SafeLinks. And so you click the link and it does safe stuff to check to see if it's legit or not, which literally is only a comparison to blacklist. Like I was running like IE exploits and everything like, like straight up from like 2014 and was getting through uh, no problem with it. Um, you know, it basically it just rewrites the URL to see if it's in a known blacklist and then goes from there. So things I'd recommend is kind of um, staying away from, from that. Their mail flow piece, which is also interesting. We just lose, there it goes. It's a glitch. Oh, hang on a second. That's no, not me. Um, I can do hand gestures, it's fine. Uh, but when it comes to, when it comes to the, um, the, the actual detection around um, uh, uh, like attachments like macros, there's a 15 minute delay when you can actually receive your attachment. So if you're an enterprise and you have advanced threat protection put on place, you have to wait 15 minutes before you can actually open an attachment, which to me is like a huge major business hindrance. I don't think many people would get that, but getting around that's also pretty easy. So here is um, an example, and I'm gonna turn my sound off because I think I have Bruce Hornsby. You can turn the sound off on the computer. I think it's Bruce Hornsby. Yeah, there we go, cool. And you can turn it off, that's fine, you can turn it off. The sound? Yeah, off, yeah, you don't need to play the music. Or you can play the music, I just have to talk over it. There we go, cool. All right, so here's a, a, an E5 account with uh, Office 365. Um, and you can see here on the left-hand side, um, I have Um, so we look at those examples and, you know, technology can assist in what we do, but it's not going to stop what we do as humans. We are, we are crafty little creatures um, in what we actually um, focus on. And maybe someday we have artificial intelligence that replaces it. And I always thought it would be kind of cool if, like, like, malware writers turned into, like, artificial intelligence malware writers. And, like, it had artificial intelligence battling other artificial intelligence. And, like, it was, like, this big, massive malware war. I mean, like, it's going to happen. It's going to be so sweet. I don't know if it's going to happen in my lifetime, but I want to, like, write the first AI malware that just destroys everything else, right? I mean, I just... Not, not, not really, but you know, like show it, be sweet. So having an understanding of, of off both offense and defense makes enterprises uh, much more secure. If you look at those examples, those are specific types of attack patterns that we leverage as attackers that you can block right now with the existing technology you have right now in your environments that can literally prohibit a lot of that from happening, right? HTAs, by the way, are like the new hotness. Well, it's like old hotness. There's actually a book from like 1998 that has like, it's like this old rainbow book, like, like traditional hacker book, and it's like a 900 page hacker book, I don't remember the name of it, but it's like, hey, you can get code execution within HTAs, that was in 1998. Still work fantastic today, it's great. So how do we eliminate the noise um, and focus on what matters? I am a huge, huge, huge advocate of application whitelisting, known good, so is Matthew Graber. Uh, Matthew Graber is, uh, uh, now works at Microsoft, uh, he went from uh, the ADP team from uh, um, Veris, um, and went over to uh, Microsoft, one of, my, one of my favorite people, I have a huge man crush on, on Matthew Graber. Um, and him and I very much believe that if you take the effort of actually putting in application whitelisting in your environment, your environment's gonna be a much better place to baseline and from there build detection off of. 
you know, if we can minimize our attack surface to application whitelisting, and then from there look at detection, and let's just say that's at 8% of people trying to bypass application whitelisting, isn't that much easier to manage than 100%? Or that your virus scanners aren't, aren't gonna pick up on or whatever we're trying to do? It's painful because you have to sit there and you have to say, hey, we have to have good configuration management. Hey, we're probably gonna break a bunch of stuff when we implement this. Yes, we need to do this on servers. Yes, we need to do this on servers. And yes, we need to do this on endpoints. Get a known good baseline and then from there look for deviations. It works. It makes it much more difficult for me as an attacker to move to different systems, to compromise other things if you have application whitelisting in place. So you baseline known good and detect on the rest. Hey, now that we know what's normal in our environment, now what, what can we start to do to look for data in our environment that is abnormal? Now we start getting into the cool hunt teaming things and the purple team exercises, the things that actually work in environments for building those detection capabilities. Easy steps. But we're not even there right now in this industry to do the cool stuff yet. The bypass techniques, the methods for, for attack and exploitation that we would hopefully detect in our environments because we're not even doing known good right now because it's too much work, it could impact the business. Um, so do the, cool, or do, the, do the hard stuff first. Do the little elbow grease that's gonna impact your business for a little bit. You know, obviously that's a whole political battle. You have to go through the whole operations. For those that have already done it successfully, congratulations. Not a lot of folks are still doing application whitelisting, which I don't understand. And then you can start focusing on some cool stuff. Some cool stuff, lateral movement. Hindering lateral movement. There's so many ways of hindering lateral movement. If you look at um, event IDs uh, within just your event logs, are you pulling event logs from your endpoints? It's a good resource, by the way. Um, you can detect things like silver tickets and Kerberos impersonation, um, Mimikatz injection, especially if advanced logging. Sysmon, does anybody here have Sysmon deployed to their environments? No, Sysmon's a free tool from Microsoft that gives you advanced logging into your memory and what's actually happening. So things like Mimikatz and process injection, those are all detectable based on just installing Sysmon in your environment. It's a Microsoft product, like it's free. You can just like deploy it through SCCM to the rest of your environment and you're good to go. Getting those logs is imperative for things like lateral movement. Lateral movement, if you don't know, we use lower protocols like RPC, SMB, um, Power, PowerShell remoting in some cases. Those have specific key lengths when you're actually authenticating to other systems. You can uh, uh, rip out RDP traffic and look just for specific lower level authentication for remote systems and look for lateral movement in your environment pretty easily with 4624 login events. Um, so those are a lot of early warning de detections, having purple teams and hunt teams, understanding suspicious processes like, hey, why is Notepad beaconing out to the internet? Easy stuff, right? Things that are, are legit. Why is run DLL32 beaconing out to the internet? Why is reg SVR32 downloading an SCT file and beaconing out to the internet? Those are behaviors and patterns that you can look for. Child processes that are spawned uh, from, from Excel. Hey, command.exe is being spawned from Excel.exe. Probably not legit. Those are all patterns and behavior that you can easily look for in your environments if you have the right logging in place. I'm a huge advocate of what we call deception or honey tokens. Um, there's, there's a lot of deception techniques you can do, like LLMNR and MBNS, uh, fake honey tokens across your network, so if someone's running Responder and Van your network, um, you know, uh, looking for that. There's a specific login event, I think it's 4648. So with Responder, you can actually dis detect Responder nodes in your environment. What happens is Responder sends out LLMNR multicast, so it sends it out to your environment. And what an attacker does, it says, yep, I'm that server, connect to me, and it passes this net NTLM v2, or net NTLM v1, depending on your environment, to that attacker, that attacker then can then crack that, uh, that password offline. It's like basically getting free credentials in your network. As pen testers, we consider that cheating. It's like the easiest way of getting domain admin in environments ever. Um, it's like literally turn on like magic credentials, start flying through. Um, but what you can do is you can actually send out honey, token, or honey broadcast across your network. It's just a PowerShell script that sends and looks for things. And you just put a fake username and password in there that's not a, a, a regular username or password in your environment. And if you ever see the event ID, explicit login credentials were used to log into the remote system, it's a good indication that someone's sitting there listening to your environment of what's actually happening. Uh, honey tokens are another great one. You can put credentials into memory um, that look like domain admins with a fake password. I believe through event log, 4624, login type, um, and then the, the specific key length. Um, if you could just look for um, detecting past the hash uh, and then look for binary defense, you'll see a whole write-up on how to incorporate that into your sim environment to detect past the hash in your environment. Really easy to do. Suspicious processes, here's just a couple. There's a whole bunch of them, but like tracker, run dll32, msbuild. Um, you can call msbuild and have it pull from a remote file share. 
um, have it execute on your machine. Um, RegS VR32 is probably one of my favorites. Um, CBD, um, there's quite a few of them out there that give you uh, uh, code execution. And remember sticky keys, the sticky keys trick, right? Well, you don't need to reboot anymore, by the way. Um, so with sticky keys, you have to reboot and you take command.exe and rename it to like, or set.hc.exe to uh, command.exe. Um, and then when the machine rebooted, you could hit the, the shift key five times and then a command prompt would pop up without having to log in and run you as system rights. But if you have access to the registry, you can just set a debug flag um, and you don't have to reboot or anything under any process that you want to or any protected Windows process you need, and then it replaces that every time you use it. So you can actually just use that registry key and then hit the shift key next time when you have backdoor persistence uh, into environments. Um, so I'd look for that registry key because it's being actively used right now. And so closing up here, I talked about a lot, okay? But what it comes down to is hard work. We have to actually do hard work in order to have desirable results. Application whitelisting, known good, is hard work. Getting to behavioral detection and weird things in environments is hard work. Sifting through the massive amount of logs that we deal with on a regular basis is hard work. Protecting our attack surface is insane, right? But it's doable. Minimizing our attack surface is doable. We just have to do hard work in our environments to go and do it. So known good is hard work. It's work that, that is worth it to me. It's work that I see that stops me as an attacker. Um, and it's work that has results. The thing about this is, is I'm excited because I think the industry itself is moving towards some really good things. Uh, I think that we're moving to a place where we're maturing as, a, as an organization, adopting a lot of things. And I'm really excited that we have so many people here, such as B-Side, Salt Lake City, and, and throughout this industry, of talented folks that are coming up with awesome research techniques, new ways of getting around things, new ways of defending. I think uh, we'll be okay in the long run. Never gonna secure, uh, never gonna solve security, period. But I think when we hit, put all of our, put our minds to it, um, we'll be a better, in a better place. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, appreciate it, and hopefully you learned something new. Thanks.